One of the things that I like about these really small creatures is that they're difficult. You can't see at once what their beauty is. You have to work your way into this world before you see the beauty of it. Some scientists have dedicated their lives to the study of microscopic creatures who live in the deepest parts of the ocean. It's a world that will astound you. Diverse and wondrous creatures, both big and very, very small, survive and thrive where sunlight never reaches, where temperatures are near freezing, and where water pressure is enough to instantly crush a human skull. On an icebreaker crossing the Arctic Ocean, an international team of scientists are part of the most ambitious initiative in the history of marine science. We have the goal to describe 500 new species from the deep sea. This historic initiative is called the Census of Marine Life. It's a 10-year mission to produce the most comprehensive survey ever of ocean life diversity. It's a mixture of um, adventure and long hours of patience. You have to wait for about three or four hours before it reaches the bottom. And the bottom is five kilometers down. Marine biologists are hoping to discover hundreds of new species of all sizes. Creatures that have never before been seen with human eyes. The first time that you are sure that you have discovered a new uh, organism, this is a very special moment. This study will also help scientists begin to understand how climate change may affect the ecosystems where these creatures live in the ocean abyss. Many scientists concede that we probably know more about Mars than about life on the ocean floor. Most of the deep ocean floor is covered in mud, but it's mud teeming with life. In fact, deep ocean mud is one of the most pervasive habitats on Earth. The microscopic creatures who live there are remarkable for their diversity of appearance and ingenious survival strategies. If you go to the deep sea like we are having here, 99% uh, of the species are unknown. While some of the work begins on the ship, most of it takes place when scientists get back to their labs on land. Wilhelmshaven, Germany, is home of the Senckenberg Institute, where much of the follow-up study of deep-sea microorganisms takes place. And when you go to dive to get material, the first thing you want is to come back to the lab and go straight to the to microscope and see what you, you had. One expedition may return with enough deep-sea samples to keep scientists busy for years. A high-speed centrifuge helps to separate the organisms from the rest of the sediment. One sample there may be about 50 to 100 species, and I'm actually working on 20 samples. So I have the next month to work through it. <laughs> you always have butterflies in your belly just to see what you have in your samples. That's good. The latest catch of microscopic creatures then get divvied up among specialists according to the class of creatures they appear to belong to. At Zenkenberg, there are specialists for polychaetes, nematodes and copepods. Copepods may be microscopic, but they have the appearance of crustaceans like shrimps and lobsters. Along the body, they also have uh, chemical receptors. They can recognize if it's food or a partner, or, uh, or they can run away if it's a predator. Chemicals emitted by the female copepod are thought to leave a trail for the male to follow. Their antennae can both sense an approaching predator and provide a means of propulsion. 
The primary food source for copepods and most other microscopic creatures on the sea bottom is called marine snow. Marine snow is particles of decaying organic matter, mostly from dead fish, which slowly drifts to the bottom. We always hope to find interesting animals, and I always uh, want to find a new interesting nematodes, which n nobody found here before. Nematodes are the speciality of the Russian marine biologist Maria Milutina. New beautiful animals. Nematodes are related to the humble earthworm. Fossil records of these creatures go back 600 million years. They may be microscopic, but there are male and female nematodes, and they do have sex lives. In some species, the male nematode dies in the process of releasing his sperm during copulation. The ratio between female and males is shifted to the females, so there are many more females than males. This is because the males, they should not uh, take the food that can be um, eaten by females, they are more important in producing eggs. And um, also some of the males, they, have, uh, they do not feed. So they don't have mouth parts, they don't have a stomach. They are just there for reproduction and probably they are short living. In about 20 years that I've been in the field of deep sea research, now more than 20 years, um, I've discovered oh, at least 50 new species. Brigitte's speciality is a family of microscopic creatures called polychaetes. Polychaetes are a type of marine worm with paddle-like structures used for navigation and lots of bristles. Worms that I've seen in the deep do not have any eyes or very small ones. Uh, some do have eyes because they communicate with light flashes. Polychaetes, along with nematodes, copepods and other species, both big and small, which live at great depths, have developed an inventive response to life without sunlight. It's called bioluminescence. It's a chemical process in which a creature produces its own source of light. This self-generated light might help locate food, scare off a predator or signal a mate. This is one of the paddle-shaped feet, and these are the bristles coming off. And this is an internal bristle that keeps the, the foot rigid. It's the distinctive details, like the shape or number of paddles, or the length and position of bristles, which might distinguish one species of polychaete from another. There have been different theories about the origins of deep-sea species. There was a theory that was called source and sink hypothesis and it means that the shallower water is a source for animals that um, inhabit great depths but they sort of fall into a sink and they stay there because they are sturdy enough to survive but they do not reproduce there or do anything. Marine biologists in the past believed that creatures at the very bottom were victims of bad luck. And that apparently is not the case. To them it's perfectly normal they find shallower water uninhabitable, so they reproduce and evolve just like animals that are closer to where we live. Every new sample brings new species. Well, I have uh, discovered many, many species. I think I looked at a uh, hundred new species. I have discovered about 500 species. I just stopped counting. People just uh, ask me, oh, how, how can you know that this is, this is a new species? Discovering what you think may be a new species doesn't make it a new species, but it is the beginning of lots of hard work. You have all the literature, then you compare your animal with this literature. I think in a day I make up to 100 trips to the drawers. First we compare the, the characteristics of the animals with the key. We get to the family or to the species. When we look at uh, the species, we have to describe them. 
I have to formally describe all morphological characters in words. For us to write in this uh, scientific English. And then we draw them. Drawings by hand are still considered to have more detail and clarity than most photographs. But photos are also taken. Only after it we can say, oh, that, that was this tractor. Then, with all this information, you uh, write a paper. An article is published. It's officially, uh, we can name it officially a new species. Just to inform everybody that there is a new species. And if you've gone through all the trouble of discovering and describing a new species, you get to name it. We can use the names of our friends or, <laughs> or mother or something like this. My uh, father is called Dita and uh, I named the species Tantulacus diteri. <laughs> A scientist from China, uh, he named to his ex-wife. <laughs> A very special moment is when I found the species that I have discovered myself and described myself in other oceans. So it is like a meeting with an old friend, you know. You see them and say, oh, I know you, I have described you, you know. When I'm drawing the, the animals, then uh, in the night I dream <laughs> of it. <laughs> I always dream about finding new beautiful Ceramani Matidas. <laughs> this one looks like nothing I have seen before. Because it has extremely long CT or bristles on, I think, the third segment. And then it has um, pairs of branchi. So this may very well be a new species also, that I'm sure are new to science. At least I've never, never ever seen anything like this because you have seen tens of thousands of animals. You just know that you see a new species when you see one. For some marine biologists, discovering a new species is a daily thrill. I don't think that we will ever know all the species that are living in the, in the abyss. There's lots of diverse life in almost every condition that we can think of and some that we can't think of yet because we haven't discovered them yet. We had the goal to describe 500 new species from the deep sea. And until now we have described about 400, so there's still 100 species to go. We are confident that we will reach the goal. <laughs>